Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. Thanks for listening today, and thanks to the over 11,000 people who've listened to the show. Today, I'm going to do the first of what will no doubt be a ton of episodes devoted to interesting Texans from all eras of Texas history. I'm calling it Texans You Should Know, and every now and then we're going to add another Texan You Should Know to the series, and there aren't any rules on this series, so if there's a Texan you think listeners should know about, Send it to me at host at wiseabouttexas.com or via Twitter at wiseabouttexas, and we'll get an episode going. There also isn't any chronological order to this, but we're going to start with a man from whom Chambers County is named, Thomas Jefferson Chambers. The very scientific reason I picked him as the first person is that I was talking to a friend of mine the other day from Chambers County, so that's how I picked him. So let's go back to a time even before Texas independence and get wise about Texas. Now, Thomas Jefferson Chambers was born in Orange County, Virginia, on April 13, 1802. Two presidents hailed from Orange County, by the way, James Madison and Zachary Taylor. Thomas was the 20th child of his father, also named Thomas Chambers. His father died when he was only 13, and his mother then moved the family to Mount Sterling, Kentucky, which is east of Lexington, to be with relatives. Chambers went to school in Lexington and studied science and language and became a school teacher. Now, while Chambers was teaching school, he also studied law with two Lexington, Kentucky judges, Jesse Bledsoe and James Clark. Now, I discovered something interesting that may explain Chambers' interest in Texas eventually. It turns out that another famous Texan, Judge Robert Emmett Bledsoe Baylor, or as we know him, R.E.B. Baylor, was Judge Jesse Bledsoe's nephew. R.E.B. Baylor is the gentleman for whom Baylor University in Waco is named. Now, Baylor was a few years older than Chambers, but studied law with his uncle, Judge Bledsoe, after the War of 1812, which was probably just a little before Chambers arrived. And Judge Bledsoe went on to serve in many offices in Kentucky and was a U.S. Senator during the War of 1812. It also turns out that he later immigrated to Texas in 1836, He had begun work on a history of Texas, and that would have been the first history of Texas, but he died in May 1836 in Nacogdoches. But I found that connection to Thomas Chambers interesting, and once again we see how the folks in early Texas had so many connections with each other. Now the other judge that Chambers studied with, Judge James Clark, was probably responsible for Chambers leaving Kentucky. In response to the Panic of 1819, which was an economic crisis in the U.S., Kentucky passed a law that provided a moratorium on debt repayments. Well, that was good news for Thomas Chambers because he was in debt at the time. Judge Clark, though, declared that law unconstitutional, so Chambers was once again liable for his debt payments. So Chambers did what many great figures of Texas history have done when faced with a debt in their home state. He left. Judge Clark, by the way, was almost impeached for that decision, uh, making all those debtors liable again, but he later went on to serve as governor of Kentucky, so that's a testament to political resilience. Anyway, Chambers headed for Alabama. Now, while Chambers was in Alabama, he was sponsored into the Alabama Bar Association by none other than the Chief Justice of the Alabama Supreme Court, who at that time was Abner Lipscomb. And here is another Texas connection for Chambers. Lipscomb had served not only as Chief Justice, but was also a trustee of the University of Alabama, which had given Lipscomb an honorary law degree, so roll tide. Lipscomb would later come to Texas and become a justice on the Texas Supreme Court, and we are going to run into him again in a few minutes. So Chambers had made some good friends everywhere he went. In 1826, Chambers decided to move to Mexico. So he sailed to Veracruz and proceeded on to Mexico City, He boarded with a Mexican family and learned the culture, learned the customs, learned to speak Spanish, and he made a living in Mexico as a translator and teaching English. And once again, he made powerful friends. Chambers eventually moved north to Saltillo, Mexico, and became a certified surveyor. Not only that, he was named the Surveyor General of Texas in 1829. Now, remember that Texas in 1829 was part of the Mexican state of Coahuila y Tejas, And there had been some settlement by that time, but not all the colonists had proper titles. The land commissioner for Texas at the time was named Juan Padilla. So Juan Padilla and Thomas Chambers were charged with locating the lands and issuing deeds to the Texas settlers. Well, Chambers wasted no time getting to work. He and Padilla went to Nacogdoches and started surveying. 
Now, Padilla was a friend of Stephen F. Austin, and he supported the Anglo colonization of Texas. He was also a Federalist who supported the 1824 Mexican Constitution. Now, I recall at this time there was a political battle in Mexico between the Federalists and the Centralists, which would ultimately result in Santa Ana declaring himself the Centralist dictator. Padilla, therefore, would have been right in the middle of all that controversy. Well, Padilla wasn't in Texas with Chambers very long when Padilla was arrested for what is described as fraud and murder. Now, it's likely these were some trumped-up charges and by his centralist enemies, but nevertheless, they took away Padilla's citizenship. He was eventually cleared of those charges and actually later became the Secretary of State of Coahuila y Tejas, which is a position he had held previously. So once again, we see some remarkable po- political resilience. When the Texas Revolution broke out, Padilla actually fought on the Texas side, and eventually, of all the places, Juan Padilla died in Houston in 1839. So when that happened to Padilla, Chambers began to represent the settlers in East Texas in the Mexican legislature. Now, he was not a representative uh, member of the legislature. He was an agent for the settlers to the Mexican government. Um, And the Mexican government paid uh, Chambers for his surveying work with land, lots of land. In 1834, Chambers received 11 leagues of land for his survey work. Now, a league is a Mexican unit of measure, and it's equivalent to 4,428 acres. Um, Actually, 4,428.4 acres. We like precision here at Wise About Texas. So 11 leagues was almost 49,000 acres. Chambers located his land in several different areas of Texas, including present-day Liberty and Chambers counties. And that wasn't all of the land deals that Chambers was doing at the time. He got a contract with Juan Padilla. He and Padilla got a contract to settle 800 families in the northern part of Texas. Now, it turns out the land they were granted was actually up in Oklahoma and Kansas, or what later became Oklahoma and Kansas. So they never ended up settling anyone up there. He also bought a five-league track from one of Juan Padilla's relatives, Vincent Padilla, in 1829. So that was about 20,000 acres. Now, this tract had not been located either, so Chambers got his surveying equipment and located it near some of his other Liberty and Chambers County land. Vincent Padilla, the seller, got his relative and Chambers' partner, Juan Padilla, to issue the title to Chambers in 1830. There was only one small problem. There were already people living on the land. Chambers now held the original title to a bunch of land that should have been held by the settlers that were living there, arguably should have been held. Needless to say, this made Chambers fairly unpopular in that area. Now, Chambers' next step was to become a Mexican citizen. He achieved this status in 1830 and set about becoming a licensed lawyer in Mexico. Chambers was given a Mexican law license in 1834, and at the time he was the only foreigner licensed to practice law in Mexico. Chambers was in Saltillo at this time and was actually named the state attorney for Texas, which is sort of like an attorney general, although the title was called assessor general. He never really acted, though, in any official capacity, and he resigned after a couple of months. Now, I mentioned that Chambers was somewhat unpopular in areas of Texas. Well, it got worse. In some prior episodes, I've mentioned the the, the Anahuac disturbances. I'll do a future detailed episode on them for now, though. Just recall that the Anahuac disturbances were two major disturbances in Anahuac, Texas, one in 1832 and one in 1835. They basically involved many rebellions against taxes that were imposed by the Mexican government, and William Barrett Travis was involved and got arrested there, etc. It was armed conflict. Well, Thomas Chambers, as you might expect, took the side of the government during those disturbances, and that did not endear him to his fellow Texians. In fact, they hung him in effigy. Uh, He had to go so far as to produce a pamphlet to defend himself, which was the 1835 version of a Facebook post or maybe a blast email. Now, I want to mention another situation that reflects the aggressiveness with which Chambers was pursuing his activities. As you may know, Stephen F. Austin was granted a second colony after his first, and his second colony was north and west of his first colony. The second colony was in an area that I'll describe for purposes of this episode as up around Bastrop just to give you a sense of where it was. Well, there was a group in Nashville, Tennessee, called the Texas Association, whose aim was to get a colony in Texas. And in fact, Sam Houston was a member of the Texas Association at one time. The Texas Association had sent Robert Leftwich and Andrew Irwin to Mexico to try and get that colony contract granted. 
Stephen F. Austin was also in Mexico at the same time, and he was actually aligned with the Texas Association, and they were working together to get their respective colonies. The Tennesseans were granted a colony, but they had a lot of trouble settling it. In order to secure the contract, you had to perform and actually settle people on the land. The Texas Association appointed a succession of agents to try and get the colony established, but it just floundered. Finally, a man named Sterling Robertson came to Texas to represent the Texas Association. Now, it just so happens that Mr. Robertson got here after he had been convicted of killing a man in the street in Nashville and sentenced to nine months in jail and a brand on his hand. His case was on appeal, which he found to be a very convenient time to come to Texas, so here he came. Now, Austin ended up getting the Texas Association grant in his own name after the Texas Association contract expired and they hadn't settled the land. Now, Robertson was extremely angry, and he thought Austin had deceived him and stolen their contract. When Austin was later put in prison in Mexico, Robertson went to Monclova, Mexico, and convinced the government to restore the land grant for the Texas Association. Now, there were some extenuating circumstances that were working in Robertson's favor. First, Austin's agent was killed by Indians on the way to Mexico. Second, the official who decided the case in favor of Robinson, Robertson was the very same official who ordered Stephen F. Austin arrested in the first place. And the third thing was that it's very likely Robertson bribed the official. Well, who was Robertson's lawyer, you ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. It was none other than Thomas Jefferson Chambers. Chambers then went on a campaign to besmirch Austin's reputation at every available opportunity. He circulated public letters referring to Austin as, quote, St. Stephen and his Saint Stephen and his trumpeter, Sam, close quote. Robertson had called Austin a tyrant, and Austin, in later correspondence, would blame Chambers and another gentleman named William Wharton for conspiring with the Mexican government to actually keep him in prison. Well, on a more positive note, Chambers might be said to be the father of the jury trial in the state of Texas. The legislature of Coahuila Tejas reformed the judicial system and required a judge for the province of Texas. The Constitution of Coahuila Tejas required a man to be a judge who was a man of, quote, probity and science, close quote. Well, Chambers, uh, I don't know if he was a man of probity or science, but he was the only foreigner licensed to practice law, and that, combined with his high-level contacts in the Mexican government, made him the obvious choice for a judge. However, at the time, there was a conflict between the Mexican towns of Saltillo and Monclova over which would be the capital of Coahuila y Tejas. And that political conflict prevented Chambers from ever organizing the court system in Texas, although he was the supreme justice of the province. He never even presided over a court. He did, however, manage to get a government decree that we now call that Chambers jury law. And this Chambers jury law was enacted in 1834, and it modified the Mexican jury system to make it look more like the United States. It was the advent of the 12-person jury in Texas. Juries were provided in both civil cases and criminal cases under the Chambers law, and an eight-person majority was required to reach a verdict. And under this law, the members of the jury could also go against the judge's instruction, and the jury's findings of facts were final, just as they most often remain today. So that was really a very significant advance in the law in the state of Texas, thanks to Thomas Jefferson Chambers. Um, jurors also, this is interesting, jurors could issue a written opinion, almost like an appellate court. If an individual juror didn't agree with the verdict, they could issue a written opinion. So that was a very interesting law and a very significant development in the Texas legal system. Well, unfortunately, the politics in Mexico got worse. The Mexican cities of Monclova and Saltillo were still competing, and it resulted in armed conflict. Chambers issued a broadside at one point calling for a meeting. Now, this was about a year before the siege of Bejar, and he called for a meeting to discuss the Mexican problems and even consider forming a provisional government. And this was one of the early discussions by anyone of revolution. Um, I might also mention that though Chambers never held court, he did not hesitate to accept payment for being a judge, and he accepted his salary in the form of land. Chambers claimed 30 leagues of land as his salary, over 120,000 acres. Now, once again, the surveyor chambers located some of that land in areas already subject to earlier claims. 
but he wasn't able to locate all his 30 leagues before the Texas Revolution broke out. Now, Chambers was in, in an interesting spot when the war began. Having been closely connected to the Mexican government, in fact, he was part of the Mexican government, he was viewed by extreme caution uh, by his fellow Texans. The Texan council at San Felipe expressed their disfavor with him in a very public way, uh, but as events progressed, he came around to the revolution side. Chambers approached that provisional count Texan council and asked it to make him a major general in the army in exchange for raising, raising 1,145 volunteers from the United States. He said he would go to the United States to recruit the men and have them back in Texas ready to fight by May 15, 1836. This was January when he came to the council. He announced that he would use his own money and his own credit for the trip and for the Texas Revolution. So Chambers left on February 23, 1836, during the siege of the Alamo, bound for Kentucky. Chambers was apparently successful in sending some troops, but nothing near what he thought he would send. Chambers didn't return to Texas until June 1837, which, of course, was over a year after independence had been won. He submitted a claim to the legislature for $23,621, which was approved, but it wasn't paid because Texas had no money. Uh, he did, however, receive some more land, about 1,280 acres. Now, this whole scenario gave rise to some controversy. Now, by this time, Chambers was already a polarizing figure in Texas, and presumably to bolster his reputation and no doubt to bolster his claims before the legislature. Chambers provided an extensive report that was published in the Telegraph and Texas Register, which was the main newspaper, in July 1837. And the report's interesting to read. In the report, Chambers makes a point right up front to claim that he had the unanimous support of the provisional Texas government when he went on his mission and to remind the reader that he was a major general in the army. Chambers went on to lament that the news of the Alamo and Goliad had reached the Deep South and nobody was really in the mood to help Texas when Chambers went over there. However, Chambers claimed that due to his persuasive powers, he convinced a Judge Quitman and a General Houston to raise some volunteers for the aid of Texas. He was writing about John Quitman. John uh, Quitman had already been in contact with Sam Houston, though, before the war and was raising volunteers for Texas. Quitman, incidentally, was the one that convinced Sam Houston not to court-martial Santa Ana later in his, while Santa Ana was being held, but rather returning to Mexico. So that was a pretty significant thing. The General Houston Chambers wrote about was Felix Houston, and it's spelled H-U-S-T-O-N, so no relation to General Sam. Felix Houston had actually presided over a meeting concerning Texas as early as July 1835, and he also came to Texas's aid. Now, Chambers also claims to have asked the provisional Texas government for help and the power to more effectively discharge his duties, but never got an answer. He reports that he heard of the victory of San Jacinto, but that the news was over a month old when he heard it, and he wasn't able to convince anyone to help Texas until the news was confirmed. He goes on to take a swipe at David Burnett, alleging that Chambers had a whole division ready to report for duty in Texas, but Burnett issued a proclamation when he was president that the Tobies of New Orleans were the only authorized agents for Texas, and that was a direct slam at Chambers. Chambers stated that the Tobies were widely known by everyone to be insolvent, and Burnett's proclamation destroyed the credit of the Republic, disgraced Chambers and the other people working with him, and generally screwed up the whole deal. Well, Chambers reported that he managed, despite all of this hardship, to provide over 1,900 men for the Texas cause, and he concludes his report by saying that his was the second major general commission issued, the first being to Sam Houston, and Chambers points out that since Houston was now the president of the Republic, the overall command of the military should fall to him, and he awaited Sam Houston's instructions along those lines. Well, Chambers' report took up most of the front page of the Telegraph, and Burnett did not take it lying down. In August 1837, the Telegraph printed Burnett's response. It was equally lengthy, and Burnett pulled absolutely no punches. Burnett criticized Chambers uh, by pointing out that Chambers' report calls for Burnett to explain himself and that that call was, quote, entirely peremptory and categorical and partakes too much of a certain little spirit that is eminently characteristic of its author to entitle it to notice. Now, that was a pretty strong slam in 1837. 
Burnett piles on by saying that Congress held jurisdiction over Chambers' mission and to, and to have to respond to what Burnett calls, quote, every disappointed aspirant or petty intriguer, close quote, would render Texas no better than what Burnett referred to as the, quote, unstable, revolutionary, and wretched Mexico, close quote. Burnett argued that when Chambers supposedly received his commission in January 1836, Texas was actually still a Mexican state, and therefore Chambers was actually a Mexican officer. And if he wasn't, then he had no nationality whatsoever. Burnett pointed out that everything changed on March 2nd when Texas actually declared independence. And then he went on to argue that all Chambers did under his Mexican commission was to flee Texas for the United States, and Burnett was not so subtly implying that Chambers ran away from the fight, which would be a huge slam on Chambers' honor. Burnett then states that Chambers did nothing to earn any money and didn't even fulfill his commission, whatever that commission was supposed to be. He alleges that Chambers never communicated with the government during the Revolution. And Burnett then proceeded to get real personal by saying that comparing Chambers to Lorenzo de Zavala, Maribel Lamar, and others, uh, if they are found wanting compared to Chambers, then the world is upside down. And he really sticks it to Chambers by quoting a poet named Edwin Ye- Edward Young that, quote, pygmies are pygmies, though perched on Alps, close quote. And he said that Chambers' belittling of others, mainly Burnett, of course, is a peculiar vanity and that Burnett feels sorry for him because he looks ridiculous. So it was a very, very strong and personal response from former President Burnett. Burnett also went back a few years to remind the readers that Chambers was appointed chief judge of Texas and that everyone in San Felipe, where Chambers was best known, did not approve of the appointment. He mentioned how Chambers made himself a uniform of white sash with golden tassels to signify his office, and Burnett said he was surprised that he didn't do the same when he was made a general. I can assure you, if you go back and read those 1837 reports, that David Burnett did not like Thomas Chambers. But why was that? Well, here's a little fact I haven't mentioned yet. Back when Chambers was appointed as the chief judge of Texas by the Mexican government, there was someone else who really wanted that spot, none other than David Burnett. The government picked Chambers. No doubt he was much better connected and and certainly a Mexican citizen for a longer time. And I'm sure Burnett was none too pleased. Remember, Burnett had a... Uh, land contract for a colony too. So he was a business competitor of Chambers before the Texas Revolution was ever born. Now Burnett did receive another minor judicial position and he wanted to be paid in land, as he put it, just like Chambers was. So that feud had no doubt been long running and played itself out in the newspaper. In the summer of 1837, I think the Telegraph and Texas Register hosted the Twitter war of its time. Well, Burnett had stepped into one of the most difficult political and military situations in history when he took over as the provisional president, and he made a lot of enemies. No doubt Chambers had an outside personality, outsized personality, and must have been quite a salesman, but there's no doubt that Chambers helped the Texas effort. Anyway, that feud was was serious and very, very public. Well, Chambers came back to Texas in 1837. He ran for the Texas Senate but got beat, so he moved to his house near Anahuac. He changed the name of the town to Chambersia, that's uh, C-H-A-M-B-E-R-S-I-A, Chambersia, after himself, of course, and began selling town lots, uh, which did not please the other people already living in the area, some on the land that he was now offering for sale. Chambers needed to raise some money because he must have found himself in a very common situation for Texans through the years, and that is owning lots of land but needing some cash. So he traveled to the United States to raise money by attempting to sell some of his extensive land holdings, and he returned to Texas in 1842. Now, an interesting thing had happened in his absence. The sheriff, and this was it was part of Liberty County back then, but the sheriff had sold uh, Chambers' homestead for back taxes, and the land had been purchased by a man named John O'Brien. In 1842, there's an advertisement in the paper under the headline, quote, Anahuac itself again, close quote. And O'Brien cautions anyone in that advertisement from buying any of the four leagues of land that he now owns from anyone but him, and that anyone with a claim on the land could apply to O'Brien for a deed. Well, that obviously was not going to work for Chambers. So Chambers filed a lawsuit against O'Brien, and the jury ruled against Chambers. Chambers. 
So Chambers appealed in a couple of different ways. First, he filed the customary legal appeal, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But he also filed that uniquely Texas appeal. One day he hid in the bushes near O'Brien's house, and when O'Brien was in his doorway, Chambers shot him dead. Now, a newspaper account of the incident did not print Chambers' name, but it did point out that some residents of Anahuac attributed O'Brien's murder to a person of high rank in the county. Now, interestingly, the newspaper story talks also of a Mr. Ferguson being wounded by buckshot at the same time and that he was not expected to live either. Now, this is curious because if O'Brien was indeed killed with a rifle, someone else had to have fired to hit his companion with buckshot because buckshot would have been in a shotgun. So any enterprising uh, listeners out there, if you've got any research or insight into the mystery of Mr. Ferguson, please tweet me at WiseAboutTexas and let's get to the bottom of it. Well, Chambers apparently said that if the law wouldn't help him, he would help himself, and he certainly did. He was never indicted for that killing, however. But remember that lawsuit that I mentioned earlier with O'Brien? Well, it was not over. O'Brien's widow kept pursuing the case all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, I need to mention that Chambers was also involved in some other litigation involving much of the Anahuac town site, and his opposition in that case was a man named Charles Wilcox. Now, I warned you that Chambers had a lot of litigation. Well, there was not only an appeal in the O'Brien case by Chambers, there was, an all, there was also an appeal in the Wilcox case. Chambers had sued Wilcox, and Chambers had been sued by O'Brien's heirs. In 1855, both of those cases came before the Supreme Court on motions by O'Brien and by Wilcox to dismiss the cases in their favor. And I might mention that both the O'Briens and Wilcox had the same lawyer, and that lawyer was Benjamin Cromwell Franklin, our old friend from episode one of Wise About Texas. And during this time, he was a very well-respected lawyer from Galveston. Well, the parties against Chambers wanted the Supreme Court to dismiss the cases, as I mentioned. Why? Well, apparently, Chambers had stolen the court records. That's right. It turns out that the O'Brien case had been submitted to the Supreme Court in 1851, four years earlier. Chambers checked out the record, which he was entitled to do before the case was submitted, and then only for three days. Instead, Chambers had taken the records and kept them for four years. At one point, he brought the records back to the clerk for one night and took them back the next morning. By the way, the Supreme Court was sitting in Galveston at this time. It would sit in different cities for different terms. Well, Benjamin Cromwell Franklin, who, by the way, had been a member of the Supreme Court when he was a district judge, he stated in oral argument that he had personally seen Chambers offer those very same records into evidence in a case in Harris County. The Supreme Court called it a, quote, most extraordinary and unwarrantable proceeding on the part of General Chambers, close quote. And the Supreme Court dismissed the O'Brien appeal, which gave the O'Brien heirs a final victory and a little bit of vindication, presumably, for O'Brien's killing. The Wilcox case, though, was a little more complicated, and the court gave Mr. Wilcox the option of having Chambers return the records or having a new transcript prepared at Chambers' expense. And it's not clear what Mr. Wilcox chose. Chambers, by the way, did not appear for the argument at the Supreme Court. He left the city claiming an illness in the family and, of course, took the records with him. Well, after the Supreme Court ruled on the motions, Chambers decided to show up before the Supreme Court and explain that he thought he had permission to keep the records and that it was all just a great big misunderstanding. Well, as you might imagine, the court did not buy it. And Wilcox, by the way, eventually won his case many years later. And that case involved the original purchase by Chambers of that land from Vincent Padilla that I mentioned earlier Um, in the deal with Chambers' partner and Padilla's relative. Oh, one more thing. Guess who was a justice on the Supreme Court that ruled, the Texas Supreme Court that ruled against Chambers? None other than his old mentor from Alabama, Abner Lipscomb. So I guess Lipscomb hadn't taught Chambers the old court record removal tactic because he did not approve of it. Well, soon after Texas enters the United States and after Texas entered the United States, Chambers decided to re-enter politics. He lost another run for the legislature, and Chambers made a total of four unsuccessful runs for governor. In the meantime, he had built a large working plantation at Chambersia, which, of course, now, thanks to O'Brien, was Anahuac again. Uh, 
And according to some of the children of the slaves that worked on the plantation, it was quite the enterprise. The general had fine horses, pure-blooded bulls. He, they said that gathering 100 eggs a day from all the various chickens and turkeys and fowl were not uncommon. The garden was very productive, and life was good. And the chamber's house had some interesting features. It was built of pine and cypress, and there was a Texas five-point star in a dormer window at the top. Now, you see those metal stars all over the place on people's houses, barns, and such nowadays, but I'm declaring that Thomas Chambers had the first one. Another interesting thing about the house was this long winding staircase on the outside from the lower gallery to the upper gallery, and it's fairly unusual, and I think it's the only staircase in the house. I'll mention that Chambers allowed a Confederate battery on his land in order to protect Trinity Bay, he named it, of course, Fort Cham- Chambersia. Chambers tried to raise a command for the Confederate Army, but was unsuccessful, so he went to Richmond, the capital of the Confederacy, and asked to be put in command of the Texas Coastal Defenses, but he couldn't swing that either. So he returned to Texas in 1863. Now, back in 1851, Chambers had gotten married for the second time, and he had two daughters, uh, one from a prior marriage and a daughter with his new wife, Annie, whose name was Stella. On March 15th, 1865, the family had gathered in the upstairs parlor of the house in Anahuac. Chambers sat with little baby Stella in his lap when suddenly a shot rang out. The bullet hit General Chambers in the chest and reportedly lodged in the chest of a portrait of him hanging on the wall behind him. Stella, thank goodness, was unhurt, but General Chambers was dead. And nobody was ever arrested for the murder, but it's thought that Charles Wilcox's son, Albert, was responsible for the killing. After the general's death, though, Chambers' widow sold the house to, guess who? Charles Wilcox. Well, one last bit of trivia. The longest-running land dispute in Texas history was a case involving a title dispute over the location of the state capitol. That case was finally settled in 1925 with the legislature paying $20,000 to the heirs of the man who claimed he owned Texas's Capitol Hill, General Thomas Jefferson Chambers. Well, was General Chambers a good guy or not? Well, that's never an easy question, especially in early Texas. It's clear that he loved Texas, and he was very involved in Texas independence. He appeared to have great business sense and a real nose for an opportunity. He was a master networker before any of us knew what networking was and was probably one of the most well-known citizens of old Texas. He had his enemies, and he didn't always end up friendly with those with whom he did business, but that's not all that unusual. But no matter what, General Thomas Jefferson Chambers was certainly a Texan that you should know. Well, now we come to the part of the show called Getting There, where I tell you how to visit a couple of the places I mentioned in the episode. A part of that Thomas Jefferson Chambers house is still stands in Anahuac. It's on the corner of Washington Street, Washington Avenue and Cummins Street, so head over to Anahuac and check it out. It's actually a piece of the original house. The original house was much bigger. You will love the folks in Chambers County, and there's a ton of historic sites to visit around there. South of the Chambers house, down Washington Avenue on the bay is a large park, and it encompasses the site of Fort Anahuac and the site of the Anahuac disturbances. So go over there and picture yourself protesting your taxes, and you'll be in the spirit of the Anahuac disturbances. Now back up on I-10, at exit 807 north of Anahuac is the Wallaceville Heritage Park and the Chambers County Museum. I believe the gun that supposedly killed General Chambers is in that museum, so pay a visit. It's a great place. So head down to Chambers County and spend a day enjoying some great Texas history. And that wraps up this episode of Wise About Texas. Folks, as I mentioned in the first part of the episode, there are over 11,000 people who've listened to this podcast, and I am really enjoying producing it and talking about it. I'm giving a lot of speeches in connection with the podcast, telling stories of Texas history. If you've got a group uh, anywhere in the state and you would like a speaker, be sure and let me know. Uh, you can email me at host at wiseabouttexas.com. We're on Facebook, Wise About Texas. I hope you'll like that page and share it. And follow the show on Twitter, at Wise About Texas. We're also on Instagram, at Wise About Texas, and I'll try to keep up a little better with that, posting some interesting pictures of Texas history. I'd love to hear your suggestions for episodes, so let me know what your favorite Texas history stories are, and we'll give them a look. <music> 
Also, go check out the show Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash wiseabouttexas and consider supporting the show financially. There are some interesting rewards up there for the supporters. Well, I hope you enjoyed getting to know General Thomas Jefferson Chambers, and until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.